The Lido in Paris is aflame with celebrities on the Champs-Élysées for the opening of a new and zesty show. Everybody who is anybody is there. The Duke of Windsor heads the notables, which include Michelle Morgan and the famous mustache of Salvador Dali and veteran Maurice Chevalier. The show itself scores an instant hit for the festive season as well as the dancing which follows. Author Francois Sagan sets the pace for an occasion that is truly Parisian, truly festive, and in every sense, a success. with the science and technology policy lady. Let's get to the cafeteria. Follow me. Back for more, I see. Glad you could join us. Last lunch hour for episode three, we talked about the big picture and which countries were further ahead in gender parity, which includes eliminating gender bias and addressing inequitable education and how creating a new classification system would help address and motivate countries to continue working toward creating a more inclusive science and technology policy sector through education. This lunch hour for episode four, we will be focusing on science and technology policy, gender parity, and intersectionality. While we have already highlighted the need for more women within the science and technology policy sector, as with any systemic issue, we need to understand how to approach this issue of equality holistically, which means understanding that there are inequities within inequality issues. In order to do that, we need to not just place a gender lens on the science and technology policy sector, but also an intersectional lens. I've asked my friend Nemo to join us as a fellow educator and introduce us to what intersectionality means. Time to pass the spatula. Hi, Nemo. Hi, science and technology policy lady. Let's talk about intersectionality. Intersectionality focuses on how gender, class, race, age, ethnicity, ability, religion, social class, and sexuality cross-cut each other and intersect to create unique experiences of discrimination. Multiple intersecting identities demonstrate the inequities within inequality issues that must be addressed in order to approach the issues at hand. For instance, a black woman in the United States who works full-time year-round makes about 63 cents to every dollar paid to a white man. However, overall, women employed full-time year-round are typically paid 82 cents for every dollar paid to a man. While all women face inequality, a black woman is still making significantly less than other women as are other minorities. Thanks so much, 
much, Nemo. We appreciate your time in the cafeteria. Thanks for having me. One thing that is very important to understand is that rarely does a systemic issue stand alone. Most systemic issues overlap in some way because they are all products of the same systems, which is why an intersectional lens is especially important when addressing issues of inequality. The issue of the lack of women within science and technology policy affects all women, but disproportionately affects women who are black, indigenous, and women of color. Not only is a lack of women within science and technology policy affecting all aspects of the sector, but concerning issues of equality, it is especially important to understand that there are inequities within inequality issues. An intersectional lens, in addition to a gender lens, is necessary to strive for the full spectrum of equality within an issue. While approximately less than 30% of women are involved in science and technology policy, when assessing the science and engineering sector that feeds into science and technology policy, 18% are white women, 7% are Asian women, 2% are black women, 2% are Hispanic women, and 1% are women from another race. When assessing the percentage of men in science and engineering that feed into science and technology policy, 49% are white men, 14% are Asian men, 3% are black men, 4% are Hispanic men, and 1% are men of another race. To continue with Nemo's explanation, intersectionality was first created as a term by Kimberly Crenshaw in 1989, which was built upon the legacy of political activism among black women and women of color in the United States. Despite differences of context and situations, intersectionality focuses on how gender, class, race, and sexuality as axes of subordination cross-cut each other. In other words, the intertwined axes of domination that Crenshaw named intersectionality. Regarding science and technology policy, intersecting identities of being both women and people of color within STEM discourses that have been historically shaped to respond to one or the other, women of color are invisible within both. Intersectionality is just a metaphor for understanding the ways that multiple forms of inequality or disadvantage sometimes compound themselves and they create obstacles that often are not understood within conventional ways of thinking about anti-racism or feminism or whatever social justice advocacy structures we have. Intersectionality isn't so much a grand theory, it's a prism for understanding certain kinds of problems. African American girls are six times more likely to be suspended than white girls. That's probably a race and a gender problem. It's not just a race problem, it's not just a gender problem. So I encourage people to think about how the convergence of race stereotypes or gender stereotypes might actually play out in the classroom, between teachers and students, between students and other students between students and administrators and commit themselves to understanding that as a way of intervening and providing equal educational opportunity for all students regardless of their identities. Identity isn't simply a self-contained unit, it is a relationship between people in history, people in communities, people in institutions. So schools do a good job when they understand that and when they commit themselves to curricular development to opportunities in the school for all students to understand the histories that have brought us to this particular moment. You can't change outcomes without understanding how they've come about. So independent schools can take the lead on that to be responsive to their student populations and to the communities out of which the students come. These unique experiences 
of intersectional invisibility increase the likelihood of being scrutinized, marginalized, and isolated by the dominant group, which intensifies the experience of being in STEM as a woman, as well as a person of color. A study using a sample of 176 participants examined microaggressions as an avenue through which women of color are rendered simultaneously invisible and hypervisible in STEM fields. Through this study, four themes emerged from participants' experiences with microaggressions that include delegitimization of one's skills and expertise, implicit and explicit messages communicating their lack of belonging in STEM, instances where both their voice and physical presence were ignored, and gendered and racialized encounters. These themes illustrate the need for an intersectional lens, as well as a gender lens, to be considered when focusing on the systemic issues of gender bias and inequitable education, which often overlap, that lead to a lack of women within science and technology policy. When addressing a complex systemic issue, such as gender equality issues in the science and technology policy process, it is imperative to take a holistic approach and understand the inequities within the inequality issues. Without diverse leadership, women are 20% less likely than straight men to win endorsement for their idea. People of color are 24% less likely and people who identify in the LGBTIQA plus community are 21% less likely. This data indicates that straight white women still have an advantage, even if they have a bias against them because of their gender, than women who are a part of the LGBTIQA plus community, black, indigenous, and women of color, or any other woman that's existence stems from multiple intersections. It is vital that these inequities are addressed when tackling gender equality within the science and technology policy sector, because true equality cannot be reached without understanding how to use equity throughout the process. While there have been great strides made, there is still much work to do concerning equality in science and technology policy. The root of this problem lies within the issues of equity and equality concerning education and gender bias, with an emphasis on equity in the process to equality. According to the School of Education and Human Development, investing in early childhood education, offering hands-on classroom learning, and providing diverse role models are among the ways educators can encourage underrepresented students to pursue careers in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. A varied group of panelists took part in an October 22nd virtual panel discussion hosted by the School of Education and Human Development on re-envisioning partnerships to support engaged science learning and success in secondary and post-secondary education. Attendees and panelists also saw the premiere of a UM film based on interviews with secondary teachers and their students, UM faculty, and local business and elected leaders. The purpose was to discuss how partnerships between public schools and institutions of higher education and business could be reimagined to support STEM careers for women and marginalized populations. In welcoming attendees, the importance of expanding STEM opportunities for Blacks, Hispanics, and women was emphasized. Several of the panelists, as well as faculty and STEM professionals featured in the film, emphasized the importance of giving science teachers more flexibility in the classroom to accommodate students with different learning styles. Academic freedom for teachers would also provide more opportunities to implement engaging hands-on STEM learning over knowledge-based test preparation. On the college level, industry partnerships, 
such as internships, can help students explore career paths in the STEM fields. But as Ji Shin, Associate Professor of Teaching and Learning, noted in the film, STEM disparities are not something that can be resolved by the education system itself. This is a larger social problem, and we need to bring resources to what happens to students outside the school and in the community. Thus, providing access to STEM learning experiences outside of the school day may also increase opportunities for all students to pursue STEM majors and careers. Events like this one create awareness around issues that could lead to action, but the vast majority of the responsibility lies in governments and institutions addressing the issues of gender bias and inequitable education, but with an intersectional lens to create equitable, sustainable paths for the most vulnerable populations. Education is a community effort. Reagan Flowers, PhD, wrote for CSTEM about ways to improve equity in STEM. One way is to provide support for educators. A prevalent issue in STEM education is the lack of training for teachers in economically disadvantaged schools. Also, STEM training for teachers often does not consider the needs of individual students. Teachers need to know how to help each student develop STEM skills, though they come from various resources, backgrounds, and experiences. STEM training needs to go beyond just general teaching of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. It needs to be specific, addressing the learning needs of students by grade level. Training also needs to address real world current issues. For example, we cannot ignore the effects of COVID-19. The current state of the world has escalated the inequity some students already face. To help students, teachers also need equal opportunity to stay on top of the latest technology, math, and science developments. The world of STEM is continually evolving. If teachers don't have the resources to learn, they won't pass that knowledge on to their students. Another way is to explore careers at home in the classroom. Sometimes it's difficult for students to associate the STEM lessons they learn in the classroom with future opportunities. For students who have not been exposed to adults with careers like mathematicians, scientists, or engineers, this can be even more difficult to visualize. Educators and parents need to find ways to expose students, impoverished, female, black, indigenous, and young women of color to people like them who have developed successful STEM careers. In seeing the possibilities in a real close-up way, they will equate what they are learning in school with what they can achieve in the future. Another way is building strong partnerships with colleges. College is daunting for any student, but results have shown concerning achievement gaps for female students who are black, indigenous, and young women of color when it comes to STEM. When kindergarten through 12th grade schools partner with colleges together, they can find ways to close these gaps. These types of partnerships make college more accessible for every student and help them learn what they need to do to succeed and reach out for help if needed. Yet another way is to provide resources for parents. For many teachers, STEM is a part of everyday life. However, for most parents, it's been a long time since they were in school and STEM may not be part of their jobs. They need resources to help students embrace STEM and move forward, regardless of economic status or resources. Hands-on activities have also proven to be helpful. Without real-world application, any subject is difficult for a child to grasp. Teachers need to provide hands-on activities and relate them to everyday life. However, to promote equity, 
These examples need to focus on universal activities. For example, a child from an impoverished family will not relate to an example that involves applying math to gratuity at restaurants or planning a trip. However, if you flip that example and use math to buy a burger or sneakers, most children will relate. Relatable, real-world examples will promote equity, decrease exclusion, and improve learning. Finally, developing business partnerships is key. Businesses can make a huge difference in STEM education. Whether buying equipment for schools who need it most, providing much needed experience through internships, showing students the possibilities through job shadowing or seminars, or launching scholarships for undeserved students, businesses play a crucial role in leveling the playing field for STEM students. Intersectionality is crucial to holistically tackling any issue involving equality. And the lack of women within the science and technology policy sector is no exception. Systemic issues cannot be addressed individually when they are all tied to a system that perpetuates them all. But it is essential to take the time to understand intersectionality and effects of systemic issues. While talking about these may seem controversial to some, it isn't controversial for those in the research community because we are dealing with what we know from data indicated from decades of research that is continually being built upon. It is important to keep in mind that someone's feelings about a subject do not equate to the results of years of research. No matter how someone feels about an issue, the only thing that can make current data irrelevant is more data from research. That is how science operates. And that is why science is considered a search for the truth, not a steadfast conclusion. What we know is that there are reasons for the lack of women within science and technology policy. And while this affects all women, it particularly affects women with multiple intersections who face more discrimination. Data indicates that gender bias and inequitable education are issues that are perpetuated systemically that affect all women that lead to the lack of women within science and technology policy, but again, especially affect women with multiple intersections who face more discrimination. Taking the time to fully understand these issues, how they intersect, and the effects they can have is crucial to understanding how to fully reach gender parity. Well, that was a hefty portion for this lunch hour. Make sure to include some self-care for dessert. I look forward to seeing you next episode for Episode 5, Science and Technology Policy Test Positive for COVID. Facts for lunch from a real lady. Let's bring the lights out and shine, come on.